Learn audio online with Audio Masterclass. AudioMasterclass.com. With a modern plug in parametric equalizer, it's possible to achieve almost any EQ curve that's required. It's also easy and quick to set. So the question is why would you choose to use a graphic equalizer in the digital audio workstation environment? Partly the reason is very subjective, similar to the way in which a guitarist would choose which of his or her guitars to play on a particular song. It's more of an instinctive feeling than a considered thought. But also, there are EQ curves to which the graphic equaliser seems naturally more suited than the parametric. Here we will consider some of the options. Corrective EQ. Firstly, I'll set a curve on the graphic equaliser to compensate for a less than perfect frequency balance. The original track, Rock by MRB38, in a short extract, sounds like this. And with the graphic equaliser plugin inserted, set to flat, This is the Waves GEQ Classic, which emulates a traditional third octave hardware graphic equalizer, like the Clark Technic DN360. Third here means one third, not the next after first and second. The main differences between this and the traditional hardware equalizer are these the input and output meters. The spectrograph display showing the left channel input in yellow, the right channel input in blue, and, as we shall see in a moment, the response curve of the equaliser, a little confusingly, also in blue. The range of the sliders is switchable plus or minus 6, plus or minus 12, or plus or minus 18 dB. The Q of the individual bands can be adjusted from 0 0.25 to 4. The left and right channels can be ganged. An additional parametric EQ is included. Settings can be stored and recalled. A quick note on the spectrograph display. The graphic equaliser divides the frequency spectrum logarithmically, so the centre frequencies of the bands of an octave band graphic EQ would double for each slider to the right. In this third octave EQ, each band is a third of an octave higher. The spectrogram will show a straight horizontal line for pink noise, which has an equal amount of energy in each third octave band. This music clip has a frequency balance reminiscent of the 1970s. It isn't bad, but it might be considered a little dull for today's tastes. As you can see, there is a fall off from around 3 kHz upwards. It isn't unusual to have a fall off at high frequencies, but starting at 3 kHz is probably a little too low. Also, you will see a boost in the bass. This isn't bad, and it actually sounds quite nice. However, for some applications where loudness is important, such as traditional AM and FM radio, too much bass content can force the overall perceived loudness to be lower. Reducing the bass can allow the mid-range to be higher in level and the track will sound louder. Taking the above into account, here's an EQ curve that addresses the issues. It sounds like this.
alternating the original and the EQ'd version using the bypass control, we can clearly hear the difference. Tilt EQ. Tilt EQ is where the frequency spectrum is skewed over the full width of the audio band, centered on the frequency you consider subjectively to be the center of the audio band. In this case, I've chosen 630 Hz, as it works well with this EQ. So frequencies less than 630 Hz could be progressively lowered down towards 20 Hz, and frequencies greater than 630 Hz could be progressively raised towards 20 kHz. The angle of the tilt would be chosen subjectively according to what sounds good. This is, oddly enough, easier to achieve on a hardware graphic than a plug-in. On a hardware graphic, you can slant all the sliders evenly using a ruler or other straight edge. In a plug-in, the process is more fiddly, but the concept is the same. In this example, the purpose is demonstration. We wouldn't necessarily say that the results sound better than the original in this case, but they certainly do sound interesting. Here's the flat version again. And here's the same track with the EQ tilted upwards from low to high. The sound is lighter and brighter. It's a different effect to concentrating on the high frequencies alone or the low frequencies alone. It does, in fact, make a point that even when using a parametric EQ, if you feel the need to boost the high frequency region, then it's worth considering the alternative of boosting the high frequencies around half as much and bringing down the low frequency region by about the same amount. Here's a comparison with the EQ alternately switched in and out. An opposite tilt will bias the frequency balance towards low frequencies. This definitely doesn't sound so good in this example because the original was already a little lacking in brightness, but it shows what can be done. Flat for reference. EQ tilted downwards from low to high.
comparison. One last point is that the range between low and high in both examples is a mere 2 decibels. This shows that small boosts or cuts that cover a wide range of frequencies can have a significant effect. A 2 dB range is probably the most that you would need. A 1 dB range can often be all that's required. Shelf EQ. Another type of EQ that suits graphic equalizers is shelf or shelving EQ. Normally in a parametric equaliser, the low frequency section and high frequency section would both have bell and shelf options. Bell is where the EQ acts around a certain frequency. Shelf is where the EQ extends from that frequency all the way to the limit of the audio range. Although you can set pretty much any shelf EQ curve you want on a parametric EQ, the graphic is more intuitive if you consider wider ranges of frequencies. In this example, I've chosen a midpoint of 630 Hz and created examples where the shelf starts immediately adjacent to that frequency in both boost and cut. Firstly, the flat example again. It's a little lower in level so that the low frequency shelf boost later on doesn't clip. And now I set a shelf of just 1 dB all the way from 800 Hz to 20 kHz. 1 dB doesn't seem like a lot, but over a wide band it has a significant effect. A comparison alternating EQ in and EQ out. Setting the sliders to minus 1 dB also has a significant effect. Since the original track is just a little dull in frequency balance, it's best to regard this as a demonstration of the method rather than a good example of what the track should sound like. and a comparison alternating EQ in, EQ out.
Likewise, the same thing can be done with frequencies below 630 Hz. With low frequency shelf boost, the results sound stronger in the bass, even though the boost is only one decibel. Comparison alternating EQ in, EQ out. With low frequency shelf cut, the results sound significantly lighter. Comparison alternating EQ in, EQ out. Individual instruments. The graphic EQ can be applied to individual instruments or vocals. Here I'll demonstrate graphic EQ using a recording of bass guitar provided by an audio masterclass student. Here's the bass guitar without EQ. <laughs> As you can hear, there's a lot of high frequency fret buzz. This can be a fault, or as here, it can be used as an expressive effect that will help the bass be clearly audible in the mix through higher frequencies as well as low. There are many occasions, however, where fret buzz can be irritating. And if a producer originally liked this fret buzz, but the mix engineer doesn't, then EQ will be necessary to reduce it. Here's an EQ setting where the fret buzz is reduced considerably. and a comparison switching the EQ in and out.
but now the sound has become a little dull. As with parametric EQ, boosting the curve at frequencies just below the cut can help. And the comparison? This is probably about the best compromise achievable, but much would depend on the context of other instruments in the mix. Another option for bass guitar is to really focus in on the low frequencies, and we can do that here with graphic EQ. In fact, where the previous example was something of a compromise, the following example could be described as bass, the whole bass, and nothing but the bass. And the comparison? In summary, although a graphic equaliser is not essential for the music recording studio, it can be an interesting and worthwhile extra to have available. I'm David Meller, Course Director of Audio Masterclass. Thank you for listening.